Ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies, welcome to yet another edition of the Mighty CBP, all part of the CBP Media Network. I'm Len. Today, I'm going to be talking to Jaime Garcia, and we've talked to Jaime quite a bit in the past, and we'll get some updates what's going on post-election in El Salvador and figure out what's going on since then, because there has been a lot of talk, especially with Bitcoin. They moved some Bitcoin not too long ago. We'll get into that momentarily, but before we do... I want to just talk about a couple of things. I've got a couple of sponsors I want to talk about. Number one, Easy DNS. They have been with us for, I think, the longest ever. So I want to thank them for entrusting us to talk about their product. Because what do they do? There's lots of different things that they do. And they do it for us as well. For example, hosting a website. If you have a website you want to get started, like we did, they are the people to talk to. If you want to have, well, if you do have a website and you want to move it over, they are a good place. They are a trusting place. Do your own research, of course, to trust your website. You can also get domain names. You can renew them as well. You can move them over. A lot of different things you could do with them. Email hosting, or you can migrate your emails over. So if you do have email services already and you just want to move it over to a more trusted place, they'll be able to help you out. Virtual private servers. There's a lot of different options you could do with that. For example, you could do BTC pay servers. That, that's a pretty cool thing, especially if you are your own merchant and you want to start accepting Bitcoin. This is one way you could do so without going through the process of setting up your own hardware. You could do no list implementations, so much more. They've been around for a long time. They've been around since the late 90s. And a lot of other op similar companies have come and gone, but they stuck around. They, they are giving good service. They're private na privacy in nature. They are really good. We like them. They do our product, our CanadianBitcoiners.com website. So thank you for that. Use the promo code CBP Media. By doing so and signing up, you're going to get 50% off your initial purchase. So do so if you haven't already done so. Second sponsor, Bull Bitcoin. Price of Bitcoin, uh, it's under 70,000, 69,400, it looks like. Pretty good. So you could buy and sell your Bitcoin through Bull Bitcoin. They also give you a few other options. If the fees are starting to cl climb, I'm not sure what they are today. I didn't check it out, but hypothetically, if they are high, you don't have to buy on-chain and take the hit with using an on-chain fee. They give you the option to buy using Lightning. Lightning is awfully cheap in terms of fees. So you buy Lightning, you buy on-chain, two different options. You could also pay your bills with bull Bitcoin. So if you have your electricity bill, you got a car payment, whatever and you have a stack of Bitcoin that you're just sitting on, you want to start selling and start using as a way to pay your bills, well, Bill, Bill Bitcoin will be the people in the middle to make sure this gets done. So you can start paying your bills with Bull Bitcoin. Also, they do have the option where you can buy gift cards with your Bitcoin. So you can start spending indirectly in the real world your Bitcoin. So you can start living on the Bitcoin standard, just the way Satoshi wanted us to do. The last thing they have are the KYC free buys. I talk about this oh so much because I love it. Go to Canada Post. You load up your, uh, show them your QR code, load up your account with Canadian dollars, and then you can start buying KYC free Bitcoin. Cheapest spread in the game, at least in Canada. I can't say about the rest of the world because I don't have much experience with that. But in Canada, it is the cheapest, easy to do, private, KYC free. How could you go wrong? Check it out. Use our promo code. And if you do that, fund your account and provide the necessary information. 21 bucks will be added to your account. No questions asked. So with that being said, I want to bring in the man of the hour, Jaime. How are you, buddy? Hey, Len. Doing well. Thank you for the invite. Thanks for coming on. Because this, I think I we talked to you a little bit over a month ago. And like I said at that time, I'm going to tell everybody, the carpet, the red carpet is always rolled out to you. Anytime you want to come on the show, Jaime, you're more than welcome to come on the show. You've been a very good friend to our, to us, and you've been providing us some really good information what's going on in El Salvador and in other parts of the world, too. So I want to just thank you so much for all the service you've done for us here. And I'm giving you some, uh, I'm blowing you here, essentially. So thank you very <laughs> much for coming on the show once again. Um, it's been a few months since you've been here. I took a look. It's I think it's November 1st, 2023. So mm, four months-ish, five months-ish since you've been here. What's gone on in your life since then? Anything new since November 1st? I'd like to get an update with you. Uh, on a personal level, just recovering from uh, from a few days of sickness. I uh, <laughs> Just the spring brings uh, brings all kinds of sickness. And uh, it's basically um, 
a, a, a combination of allergies and germs and flu and everything. And I, I guess, you know, my, my only excuse to, to not being well prepared with a, a Bitcoiner uh, immune system is that I haven't been eating enough steak. Uh, <laughs> there was an Airbnb that didn't have cast iron uh, skillets. So, you know, unfortunately I was cooking one of those Teflon ones, not enough, uh, uh, you know, run free grain, non grain fed chicken eggs, you know, <laughs> all that. I've been eating vegetables. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> there you go. Not, right. enough, not enough sunlight, vitamin D, uh, probably too much uh, canola oil. All this, all the, all the jazz, right? So, but I'm, I'm on the men. So this is, this is a good way to get back on, onto things. But um, uh, on a personal level, super busy too. Like I uh, just, uh, you know, uh, I, as you know, I don't do this for. For a living is just uh, just passion of mine on the side, and so uh, my family's my passion, and my kids are quite involved in uh, um, in athletic activities. And right now, the one kid's like been traveling all over Canada and um, in the U.S. Uh, doing some competitive stuff, and so we've been just following her over. So I, I got a stack of uh, Telegram <laughs> and emails to get back to on on everything under the sun, but uh, so giving asking everybody to give me grace and um uh from bitcoin perspective has been a lot of stuff going on lots of stuff i mean like both on the technical level and the cultural level as well as uh, uh things developing in el salvador so there's lots of lots of exciting stuff like the price action and all the things that people get you know talk about i don't really pay too much attention but you know some of the more underground stuff and especially when it comes to el salvador i try to keep my my uh, my hand in the pulse so yeah like there's uh lots of things to talk about and you know i'm happy to you know provide some context i don't always have the answers but wherever you want to start len well i want to do a little bit more personal there. are you still playing soccer oh yeah yeah <laughs> I, and i think that's why i truth be told i think that's probably why i got sick because um <clears throat> i've been uh I've been playing a lot of soccer lately, and uh, although I haven't gotten injured, I think that just uh, playing like games back to back and just uh, running myself run, running myself silly, like being on a couple different teams, guest playing for other teams, like that eventually sort of uh, takes a toll on you. And I think my circadian rhythm's a little bit off because sometimes we got to play like late at night, and so. And uh, I'm I'm not a I'm not a fancy player. I'll I'll, I'll let you know that uh, I'm one of those dudes that never scores, but I uh, I do all the um, all the all the work behind the scenes, cut some Indoors. passing lanes, uh, you know, just make sure that everything's neat and out in defense and and re redistribute the ball to the ones who can up top. So, yeah, we do indoor. Yeah, you, you need a um a workhorse back there just to to clean up the mess. And yeah, you're that's, right. That's uh, me. That's me. Uh, Pirlo, like, if you know who he is, Pirlo was the guy that that he he played a little bit defensively, but he was always feeding the ball out. Yeah. And so you needed something like that to make the initial pass out to, to to direct the play, and then from there it could go. But indoor is something special because it's a yeah. faster game. That, it you is. Know, and I I don't I've played it before and. Wow, like it's just incredibly fast. Is it five plus a goalie against five plus a goalie? Yeah. Is that typical? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You gotta constantly scan. You gotta constantly scan because if you don't, if you receive the ball and you don't know where you're going, like somebody's on you right away. And like I, I play on a I'm I'm on a legends league now. <laughs> so Le legends is 45 plus. So legends, and I'm also on, on masters, just 35 plus and uh, and regular league. And uh so I've been playing uh, all three leagues. Uh, but, um, but like when you play, uh, down in the regular league, you get some like teenagers or some 20 some year olds who are super fit, Poof. you know, like you gotta play like I, you know, even like five years ago, I would still try to keep up with them. Now I just got to use the, the wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You're, you are progressing to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, have you been traveling? Have you been back to El Salvador in the past few I, months? Or? No, no, not El Salvador. I uh, just, but just all around Western Canada with my daughter. So yeah. That's awesome. Okay. 
Now, I want to dive deep a little bit into something more Bitcoin related, actually more El Salvador related. Since you last were here, El Salvador had a general election and they elected a new or re-elected a president, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how to call it because he stepped down. <laughs> um, maybe you could give some insight as to essentially what has happened in the election, what's happened post-election. Because as an outsider for me, looks like it was status quo. He ran, he won, and then he just continued working in the office which he vacated not too long before that so it seems like it was status quo but has anything really changed in the grand scheme of things so yeah i would say that um you know the big change is uh, it gives uh, el salvador continuity and stability for the bitcoin project in a big way um so the elections took place on february 4th of this year they were observed by several international bodies including the the uh, o, uh, uh the organization of american states the oas um the un and uh, the european union um you know their reports were that they were there were some irregularities with the election however these irregularities weren't in the form of any fraud or undue or untowards sort of a uh, scheming it was more like wi-fi wasn't available they ran out of you know uh like supplies there was miscommunication just really mundane stuff the same kind of irregularities that like you would find in you know like any other healthy democracy right i'm not saying el salvador is like a healthy democracy but you know in terms of this election like i think that it was um you know widely viewed as um as open and fair um one of the things that i would say is that um the ruling party uh new ideas uh, and Bukele's party had an um uh uh like a great advantage they they garner more donations they they had a huge machinery one of the criticisms was that um the uh opposition parties were non-existent in terms of advertising like the typical campaign that you see like months in advance didn't take place because first of all new ideas didn't have anything to to respond to in terms of either like counter campaigns or anything like that and no ideas which party are they belonging to the, the governing or the opposition party uh it's the governing party Nayib Bukele's uh party so so there was like like an odd lack of campaigning by all parties and um and so so sometimes that was viewed kind of like as weird but just because like in El Salvador campaigns are huge. It's like there, there's party. There's a lot more money going around. One of the things that didn't happen this year was that the money wasn't, because um, uh, amazingly, just like in Canada, uh, uh, parties get um, government funded, but uh, El Salvador didn't advance those funds because they're based on a vote. And so uh, the the Ministry of the Treasury gave the, the money to the parties after the votes were garnered not in advance um and um and so they couldn't use those funds to campaign and so um but other than that um you know that it, they were pretty open and free from from those organizations perspectives um and Naib Bukele won like over 80 percent of the vote which gave him a huge mandate huge stamp of approval from the uh, Salvadorian uh, electorate to continue to do what he's been doing. New ideas elected more um, deputies in the assembly than they had before uh, in terms of like um, the proportion of the seats. And why that, why I say that is because actually uh, there was a law that was passed that reduced the number of seats in, in the assembly from 84 to 60. And so they garnered um, over 80% of the, the wow. seats. So the opposition was decimated, absolutely decimated. If they had, they, and right now, New Ideas has like, 
the ability to pass laws without any negotiation, even with their allies. Their al- they even they decimated their allies even uh, before they had um, another party uh, that they had to sort of negotiate. Now they don't have to do that. The flip side of the coin is that now there's huge, huge expectations around that. And I think that uh, in a way that they can't really even say uh, and point fingers to the opposition, I think that this second mandate really gives um, Bukele and his government and the new idea parties a, a huge responsibility to deliver. And what the population has been asking for now that it's vastly agreed and widely agreed that the issue of security has been addressed, that the economy is the one thing that people want improved. They want jobs, they want opportunities, they want, you know, they want Salvadoran people to prosper. And um, they really want the promise of, of, of a prosperous El Salvador. And if Bitcoin's going to be a a gateway to improve the economy they want to feel that right um but but of course you know that you know this is kind of where where i tell my family and friends in el salvador that it's really not ultimately up to the government to fix things there has to be a mindset shift in everybody's um in everybody's mind you know that that that's what they want to do and so um you know, it's it's a mindset that has been changing in El Salvador, but it has to take place at a mass level, not just in a few sectors of of the population, right? And so, um, and so, yeah. So we'll we'll see what happens here. Um, I think that, uh, but in terms of governance and just public policy, um, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, New Ideas and Bukele have a blank check. But they definitely have a huge mandate. And if they don't deliver, if things don't improve in terms of the economy, which is like, you know, they people want to keep the security issue at the forefront and not relinquish one inch from that. But now the expectation is that El Salvador will improve in terms of the economy. There's a lot that you said there, and we'll be unpacking a few different nuggets you said there. But Initially, I want to talk about the election process itself mm-hmm. and the fact from the outside, I'm not exactly sure how long it took from when they opened the polls to when they closed it and when they called the election, but it seemed like it was rather quick. Um, it didn't it didn't draw out for days, weeks or months. It was just, you know, they counted the ballots, made a decision and went from there. So <laughs> you were talking about healthy democracies. There are some out there, maybe you're looking down south, where it takes them a heck of a long time just to figure out who's won a particular election. A particular election. Now, granted, the size of the election is different. The population of El Salvador is somewhere in the vicinity of six and a half, maybe seven million people at that. And the United States is what, uh, three, 350 million people. So there's a huge difference between the two. I guess, I get it. But still, it's a copy paste situation. Um, so how long did it take for to come out with a decision with the El Salvador election? And based on that, it, was there any criticism on how the process was run or anything? Or did it just seem like I, I know you mentioned a few things like there was some outages, Wi-Fi and stuff. But generally, was was everybody happy with the process? Uh, not the opposition to Bukele, obviously. Um, and, you know, uh but uh, the the electoral candidate actually is set years in advance like for example for the next uh, uh, legislative and presidential uh, election we already know when that's going to be and and when candidates are supposed to register etc cetera, etc cetera. and so when we think about that it's it's been sort of like on the go for a long time like uh candidates had to bid register by last October and so like you know if if you don't know that that's all that all that's happening it seems like it happened rather quick but to me it's taken a long long time because I've been sort of monitoring all that um but um if it actually um it but that was one of the criticisms by a lot of these uh, international observers is that it took too long, right? So what happens is like similar to what happens here in Canada, uh, the scrutineers count the votes. Um, every 
party has a scrutineer or an observer, as well as the the official uh, elections body has has an elect observer and basically a, a supervisor that signs all the the declarations and 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 the acts they call them right and um that happened relatively quickly mm-hmm. is uh, where the irregularities came is that um trans uh, in inputting that manual process into the that da- uh, into the database that's where uh you know the database was offline or wasn't accepting um the entries and so but all that doesn't really matter because the the manual acts were signed there were witness there were notaries present everybody agreed observers looked at them and then yet yeah, like all the manual stuff was available right so um and um so it took about a week a week and a half for the results to be official but it was known that that evening that um you know what was happening that they were uh that bukele was the overwhelming winner Mm -hmm. that uh um new ideas was going to be uh having a an absolute majority Um, it's a matter of how much they're gonna how big the majority would be yeah Yeah. basically basically and the more that they and they went through a manual process of counting one by one in front of like everybody and and the more they counted in front of everybody it was funny because like uh the the more scrutiny came like that was had in the whole process the more like seats the opposition to bukele lost and they're like oh there's got to be something wrong and it, like it was just comical and um you know um i i sort of mused that like um and this is true kind of for a lot of things. It's like when you don't like the results of something, you often blame the process, right? Yes. But but seldom do people, in whatever it is, but in this case, the election, have like a kind of like a self-critical moment where they look at what they've done and say, you know, in their case, well, have we offered any alternatives, any viable alternatives that people can get inspired by, that people can stand behind, that we can actually, that we have a plan that we can concretely deliver? And, and the answer was no, like their whole, like, you know, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to like park my biases and look at everything objectively and look at, you know, some of them didn't even have platforms and so i just thought well we you have to offer something to to the population that they're that they're inspired by and they didn't offer anything that they were inspired by in fact most of them were saying well you know all those things that worked in terms of cleaning up um the crime we're gonna stop them because we're putting like innocent people in jail (laughs) The, the reality is that like you know it's not widely a widely held view that that's what's happened and in in fact there's interviews in local television of of mothers of prisoners who say i i love my son he's he you know he is my son but damn it he belongs in jail <laughs> don't let that guy out <laughs> yeah you know cuz yeah he was terrorizing the neighborhood and you know i live in peace now you know and um and so that that was really common, and um, you know, the, there's people that, um, and everybody had been affected by crime, myself included. You know, uh, so so I think that when when these alternative or, or so called alternatives to 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 Bukele, you know, p- proposed different policies that sounded like they were gonna ease up on security it just pushed them further away. And so um, I think that, um, you know, what's really happened here is that people want to continue and like they've doubled down on, on the, the continuation of where Bukele is taking the country. In terms of international criticism, I'm going to use that term. I know the BBC I, they, uh, there was a reporter that was talking to President Bukele, 
And he was asking him about this very topic, about the fact that they are jailing potentially innocent people. And he had a very good reply to, to this journalist. And he was saying, well, police in our country, the same as it is your country back in the UK, they're not perfect. They are going to jail people. Sometimes they'll make mistakes and they'll jail people that are innocent. That's why the court system exists is to prove who is innocent and who is guilty. And he did a, a masterful job of proving that this criticism, yes, there may be some merit to it, but the reality is police, you know, they're based on the information that's given to them and they're going to act upon it. They're human beings. They don't have all the information. Even sometimes courts too will make decisions that are not, they could be, you know, bad decisions in the end, not truthful, but hopefully they fix everything. That's just the reality of it. So I just want to say, Bukele, he's been able to parry a lot of these criticisms, even internationally. And it was good to see him to, to take that, bbc reporter to task i'm not sure if you saw that uh i did yeah uh the simplicity of how he's able to disarm these erroneous arguments uh or rhetorical questions because they're not questions at all it's just amazing like all i can think of is like uh like a jujitsu master, just like doing like, you know, somebody's coming in with all these like fancy moves and just immobilizing them with a couple of like holds and them tapping out. Right. Because yeah. it's like, it's, it's just, uh, it, he makes his questions or arguments look ridiculous just by the sheer examples and the simplicity of how he conveys and communicates. He's, he's an excellent communicator, right? Yes, he is. And, and I think that he's, uh, he's quite talented. And I think this is why people fear him too, like him using those talents in, in a way that would harm. Um, but I think, you know what? It's not just BBC reporters. Many Bitcoiners who uh, first may have been like really enthusiastic about what was happening are now like... Uh, hating on El Salvador for some reason and it's like okay like that's fine but you know like at, at, at the same time it's like what's to fear about El Salvador it's just it's dinky little country who nobody even heard of up until this thing happened and like just let them do whatever and see what happens in 10 years and if you know if you still don't like it that's it you don't that's the thing is you don't have to buy El Salvador yeah, leave it. <laughs> Look, there, there isn't, from my vantage point, there doesn't seem to be rampant human rights abuses going on over there. At least to me, uh, there, you know, maybe one person who, or a few people who got uh, are jailed, they may claim that, but the reality is, the crime situation, the security has improved tremendously in the past few years, and um, I guess a lot of it has to do with, with Kelly's policies that he's put in place. So the people that have criticism, the Bitcoiners too. Uh, I wonder how much skin they have in the game. You and your family, they come from there. So, and you still have family there. You, I, you travel there periodically. So you have a, a like a much stronger connection to El Salvador than yeah. I would say 99.9% .9 of the people out there that are criti critical or even supportive of it. They they maybe support, but really the, rea the reality is they don't have a clue what's going on in comparison to somebody like you. So that's the one thing. I'll take away from this. When I when you speak about what's going on there, I'm taking that almost as gospel because let's be honest, I, I have no other connection to the actually I got a few other connections. Yeah. But um really I, I take your information much more at face value. So much more uh like as per gospel as per somebody else. I'll take it at face value. That's just you know randomly create criticism about El Salvador. So I essentially say screw it. for those people, I would just say, you know, try not to let them get to you. You know, I try I try to be balanced about it, right? Because like, you know, and, and acknowledge that there is some potential um you know problems, you know. And, and the the one thing that I keep hearing from a lot of Bitcoiners who are often viewed or fancy themselves as you know, libertarians, and I often question if they even know what that means, you know, because often they, they, they don't even know what classical liberalism is, or they don't know who John Locke is, or, you know, or Adam Smith, you know, the the, the fathers of, of, of classical liberalism, right? But, and, and, and they often throw quotes without really understanding the context. And one of the ones that they throw around is, uh, a Benjamin Franklin one, and uh, 
can't remember exactly how it goes, but um, it's something along, along the lines that, you know, those who give up their liberty to obtain a little security deserve neither liberty nor security, right? And uh, yep, Benjamin Franklin said that. But let's maybe explore in the context of why Benjamin Franklin would say that. And that was at a time when him and the 13 colonies were still negotiating some sort of independence from the crown, right? And uh, and so then, you know, the crown really didn't want to relinquish power. And they were sort of saying, look, you know, uh, if, if, if you want to go at it alone, you know, you're, you, you're going to, what are you going to do when you're belligerent force, when belligerent um, people try to take over and overthrow, you know, your, your governments and your, and, you know, don't you want the British army there? And, and, um, and the reality is that uh, for Benjamin Franklin, that was the context. It wasn't the context that it was that El Salvador faces. And, and from, Franklin's perspective, I would argue, no, that you don't want to give up any, any of your uh, of your freedom and your liberty because, you know, they had they had food security, they had infrastructure, they had governance, they had an army, they had armament, they had all of the basic um, elements of a nation state, and they had absolutely no need for a, a colonizing power to to look after them <laughs> so it's just ridiculous to even use that quote in the context of el salvador right but you know it's it's a very click and baity kind of yeah. quote and and everybody gets excited and it's like yeah salvadorans are stupid they don't know what they're doing yeah <laughs> so but anyway well you mentioned also people are hoping that there'll be an, an improvement on the economy especially after this election it's gonna be it's one of the key points that Bukele and team are going to have to work on. Now I'm looking at, at El Salvador. It's a, it's a very s relatively small country. And I, I would imagine their economy internally can only be pushed so far. They're going to have to rely on a lot of external factors, namely their probably their neighbors, Guatemala, Honduras, and so forth. And even further Mexico and the United States, the United States, they, that's the currency which they use. So as the U S dollar goes, I would imagine as goes the, El Salvador economy as well. So I, really, I'm just asking a long-winded question is, how impactful can they do domestically to improve their economy? Or is are they like really, really um, reliant on external forces to help them move forward? Or do they have an opportunity to improve things internally to really improve their economy? Okay. So... It's, it's difficult because El Salvador is in a rebuilding phase. It's one of the most densely populated countries in Central America. And when we look at um, GDP alone, you know, it's got one of the lowest GDPs in Central America. Of course, it's the smallest country, and um, um, but it has many, many good things going for it. Growth rate is, is high for GDP. I'm looking right now 10% annual rate in 2021. I'm not sure anything since then. So that at least is very positive. Right. I mean, a lot of people sort of argue it as kind of like the bounce back from COVID as well. But, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, uh, we can split hairs over that. I think that the reality is that um, El Salvador's a heavily uh mountainous a lot of people don't think that because it they they only view the the beach the coastline but it's heavily mounted like a mountain range um not a lot of prairies or plateaus to for for food um uh, cultivation which is a huge problem for el salvador because it does actually does not have the ability to feed its own population. It imports most of its um, vegetables from Guatemala. It imports most of its um, beef. Well, when people enjoy nice Salvadorian grass-fed beef, is actually Nicaraguan grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it it has to import a lot. It has to import its uh, actually it it exports its energy this year, but um, it often imports its energy. Um, it imports a lot of LNG. Um, it, it imports um, many, many things. It's a net importer. It's not an ex ex exporter. And, um, and that's why 
heavily relies on remittances. So El Salvador needs to change that. And, you know, what what I understand is that uh, uh, the current Salvadoran government has taken the Singapore model as the one that it wants to follow. Singapore is a small, well, it's basically a city state and uh, it it can't produce much. So what is it going to compete on? Well, it's going to compete on its services in Singapore, specifically its financial services. And you look at the transformation of Singapore over the, you know, five decades, it's been formidable. Right. And, um, and so that's what it wants to do, but you know, how can we compete on traditional financial services when everything really is run out of, wall street or you know probably panama right so so then this is where bitcoin becomes important it wants to be the financial center of the future based on bitcoin and it wants to um uh really focus on it uh and imp- uh, attracting it companies it's passed laws so that it companies who set up shop in el salvador um are favorably taxed or not or have a grace period in terms of taxes right it so it's built in a lot of incentives for for a service-based tech-based economy to set up shop in el salvador but you know it, it you know bukele knew that it couldn't really do even if it did all of that and there was no security there is really no point in doing it that's why you know they addressed the the security issue first and now that that's in place they're developing a lot of these things and it's the same thing with the tourism you know like tourism sometimes one of the things that i hear is like el salvador is great but the hotels suck that's true because you know like we just don't have the infrastructure actually a lot of people like that is the charm of being unspoiled yet you know and 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 not having these like um very americanized very sort of like um sanitized kind of areas that you know, don't look any different from any other American resort, right? So there's still a bit of that charm left, but it, all that is going to modernize. It's going to probably look more like um, what people are used to over the next two, three years. <laughs> people have a small window to enjoy El Salvador oh. as is, unspoiled. <laughs> so enjoy it while it's here. It may disappear and it may become more Americanized, in which... Uh... I Quite say, probably, lose, yeah. Lose term. As yeah. as it tries to seek more more tourists, right? So, you s- mentioned something. You were comparing this whole process, maybe to similar to how Singapore has it. Now, Singapore, um, they are very strict in their laws in terms of what you're able to import and do over in Singapore. Uh, so in terms of that, you know, I can see there's some similarities, you know, the way things are getting more strict in terms of the security in El Salvador and trying to, to rein in all the, the security problems they had. Similarly, Singapore, they have very little crime because they have a diligent and militant force out there just to, you know, <laughs> but do you, do you remember when there was a Canadian that like spat out gum and then he got like caned? It was an American. So it was, oh, was Michael, it American? Yeah. Michael something. It was under the Clinton administration. Yeah. And they were they were talking to the people in El Salvador to try to uh, eliminate that the, the caning. I think they managed to reduce the caning. I don't know what the number was supposed to be, but they, they reduced it, but still it was Oh no, he, I think he got it though. Like he, they're like, yeah, okay, well, we'll do one less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was double digit numbers from what I understand. But yeah, yeah. It was a gra- I think he did some graffiti in a car or something. It's something really what? bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it mean, just, I didn't know. I was Yeah, this but, was the mid 90s. So yeah, that was um that was, you know, that's Singapore. Actually, I have other stories I I could talk about it because I have a, a now since the deceased friend who lived there and he would t- tell me stories about how it was in Singapore, but I don't want to make this a Singapore uh, discussion. But one thing they do have over there is mandatory military service. Does that also apply to El Salvador? Do you have no, to do military? No, it's voluntary. It's voluntary okay. military service. And okay. in fact, it's it's a career for 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 people. You know, there's you, you, there's uh, different streams that people could go into. Like they can go into policing. They can go into the Navy, the Army, um, the Air Force, and um, and uh, it it it's 
it's it's a career now whereas before it was it really wasn't so no that's that's cool i know like other countries i know italy has the mandatory service and well, whatever mm. i'm not gonna go too much into that no but... I, I don't think that 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 is in the in the cards i i think that we still have a lot of um open wounds from um the uh the civil war and where um they would they would forcibly cons uh cons you know uh recruit people and and it, it never like that i don't think they want to go there yeah okay that's fair now in terms of bukele running again is there any opportunity for him to run again or is this his last opportunity or i don't know i'm curious like are the laws restrictive are they going to change i want to hear your thoughts about this as they stand right now he cannot in fact the supreme court and the in the ruling that opened the door for him to run for a second term was quite um um prescriptive in saying that he cannot run for for a third time so this is it this is it. Unless, unless they change the constitution. <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath about that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it, I think it's going to happen. Very good. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to go there. You know, if things are going really well and people are supportive of his policies, why wouldn't they be supportive of that type of temporary change to give an opportunity to run again or even in perpetuity? I don't know. Um, because like every Latin American country is exactly the same and it's never worked in any other Latin American country. So why would it work in El Salvador? Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. I right. Don't I don't know. I don't know. That's what I keep hearing. It's like, you guys, you're all, you're all just different kinds of Mexicans and it's never worked for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Bitcoin mining over there. You were talking about electricity um, and you're, you were saying that they, for the first time, you were starting to uh, export electricity, but still, you guys are. Or when I say you guys, El Salvador is an importer of electricity, right? Is that for so? In terms of Bitcoin mining, that's probably still not going to be in the cards because it takes an extraordinary amount of energy to do it. And if you are exporting, sorry, importing energy, it doesn't make any sense to do Bitcoin mining. But I know that they were going to do that geothermal um, thing where they're going to use the the geothermal energy from the volcanoes to try to, to use that for Bitcoin mining. But what's the status of this? I haven't heard much yeah. about their Bitcoin mining operation. So a new hydroelectric plant actually came online about um, uh, just earlier this this year. And it's, um, it's uh, man, I don't know how many megawatts it's producing, but it's quite a bit. And, um, and that actually allowed, um, there was a, a, a schedule raise in electricity um uh and the electricity bill and that and that plant coming online actually allowed the race not to go up in fact people got a rebate or or oh. a, bit, a bit of a discount because of that and that allows uh that excess capacity to be exported to honduras nicaragua and and guatemala when needed um so and and so from my understanding, any excess capacity can be diverted, uh, easily diverted to, to things like Bitcoin mining. Uh, I know that um, uh, in Berlin right now, uh, they, they have some uh, Bitcoin mining that is happening. And if you um, remember last week, uh, actually almost two weeks ago, Bukele announced that there was um, uh, the transfer of all the Bitcoin, well, not all, but uh, a large chunk, uh, and I quote Bukele in his tweet, of their Bitcoin reserves into cold storage, and it was a lot more than the uh, claim DCA that they were doing. And in earlier tweets, he had said that that, that is actually because of uh, my, mining capacity as well as their passport programs and government mm -hmm. services. So there's, um, so they have been mining and they have been obtaining uh, my, uh, Bitcoin from mining, and um, and and so they they actually had almost double of what was estimated that they would have, probably a little bit more than double of what they um, estimated, and they're still DCAing one so, per day, right? Yeah, yeah. And the Bitcoin wallet is actually public and people can see it. There's a lot of shit coins going in there too. A lot of uh 
ordinals, 546 <laughs> Satoshis transactions, shot, so Lo lots of dust, lots of dust going in there. Oh man, so, what, what are your DRC 20s? What, so what are your thoughts of the, this whole new initiative for them to, as they claim, transfer a big chunk of their Bitcoin to a wallet? They say this is a physical wallet within their national territory. So to me, that seems like a good thing because it is one extra layer of preventing them from getting rubbed yeah. is, you know, leaving it into a, somebody else to deal with it. You never yeah. know what's going to happen it's because they made some enemies along the way here too, right? So, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on them now, you know, uh, keeping this domestic and in their national territory? Yeah, I would say that um, over the last um, eight months, uh, the the relationship between El Salvador and 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 the United States has been a lot more uh, reconciliatory. Uh, they have good relations with China and they have good relations with Russia. So I would say that right now their foreign relations is actually at an all time high. Uh, and considering everybody, <laughs> you know, and, and not an, and, uh, and 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 not being subjugated at the same time. Um, to our knowledge, I think that everybody has is somewhat subjugated, including Canada. Um, so, so then, um, um, so I think that that that, but but um, I think, and and I wrote a little article on that. I think that it was a wise move, um, from what I know. And uh, if somebody is able to prove me wrong, I I will happily correct my my articles and my statements. The custodian was BitGo which is an American based company. And, um, and so once they transferred it, uh, my understanding is that, um, you know, if Bico was the custodian, then those, those funds would be transferred over to the uh, cold storage wallet that is presumably in El Salvador. That's amazing now that they have control, total control over it. Hopefully that they're using some sort of multi-sig and passphrase or something just to provide extra layers of security in terms of just one person getting access to that wallet and taking it all because that's yeah. a, it's a large sum of, of, uh, of funds that, like you said, it was much larger than what we were anticipating. And it was all due to the partially due to mining and the passport, uh, the residency services that they're offering up for Bitcoin investment in, in El Salvador. The nature of that address and my understanding of how that's composed, it, it seems to be a multi-sig uh, wallet. But I, you know, like, I think that there are some very practical reasons why El Salvador and any other nation state that's collecting Bitcoin or it's, you know, it's probably not going to be completely transparent. There is, I think some, um, I think that there, it's probably wise to keep like an element of opacity around how their entire thing is constructed, right? Yeah. I think they're, they'll they'll be able to ensure instill confidence that they'll mm -hmm. able, look. They're the first nation, yeah, it's, and and right now the only nation that has Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, Digital Fort Knox. For, Fort Knox, I like yeah. Fort Knox is a, is a funny one. Do they actually yeah. have the gold? Is the question. I, I'd love to know if they actually. I don't know when the last time it was audited, but if you go to the address right now, you can see how many how many bitcoin el salvador has yeah exactly that. or at least how many they have so i gotta feel a question from the audience here now ballsy gull is asking which country is most likely to follow el salvador's lead and adopt bitcoin maybe they're just throwing this out there if you have any uh, idea who you think is next mm. to do what el salvador is doing as it is, I don't think um, uh, people are going to follow the Salvadorian uh, recipe, but I think the way that um, <clears throat> Argentina is going about it is okay uh, because um, they're basically saying you can you can transact in, in any currency and they don't have to actually make it legal tender. W one of the things about making legal tender in El Salvador uh, that benefits um Guatemala in particular is that they have a law that you know people in Guatemala can transact in any legal tender currency as long as the accepting party is open to accepting that legal currency. And they would be because if they're accepting it, that's yeah. yeah. So so I would say that um, uh, uh, as a template, I'm not sure anybody is going to follow it. 
because just like Bitcoin had success because it was off the radar of anybody uh, and it got to a point where they couldn't stop it. I think that if the next country was to sort of follow the same footsteps as uh, as El Salvador, it would be like sideline right away. I mean, like I think Honduras even mused with the idea, and then I think they they got taken to the side and they they were <laughs> promptly scolded. Don't At least that's there. that's the vibe that I get from what what was what happened. So so I think people have to like be creative about you know how they're going to do it, and I think Argentina has a pretty good recipe. To, and I think uh, Francis Pulio actually said just re- remove capital controls around Bitcoin, and I think that that kind of gets you most of the way there. Yeah, agreed. Uh, actually, yeah. it gets you there. That's what all we want is the ability to, to transact with it without dealing with the headaches of. Uh, dealing with our tax people here, CRA and other places, IRS or whatever. Jaime, do you have a, some time for a few more questions or are you sure, up yeah. to the clock? No, so no, no. I, I guess the, number one is uh, recently we had a, an announcement from El Salvador that they have eliminated income tax. Uh, 30% taxes were on investment for uh, overseas and also for uh, remittances. So I didn't know remittances had were imposed a 30% tax and that's now gone? Um, so it's just a transfer of, of money over, over certain, uh, amounts. Um, just like it's, it's kind of like when you go to the States and you have to declare like, you know, oh, I'm coming here and, uh, I swear I don't have more than $10,000 on me. Right. And if you, if you say that you have more than $10,000 on you, then you got to pay taxes on that. Yeah. Right? So now that that's gone. And you can go to the country and you don't have to pay taxes on if you if you're bringing more more than that amount or any yeah. well it's it's completely gone you don't you can bring as much money to the country and i never really understood that because if you're bringing money to the country you're probably going to spend it there so it's probably going to stay there so what would you want to like tax it you know because they're going to spend it and people are going to like get like the benefit of that right so then you just create a you're you're creating a disincentive or like a, of 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 not bringing money into your country because you, you know you're going to take 30% of people's money anyway right so i think it's it's a good move and um yeah sorry my dog's it's, crazy it's okay i didn't realize you had a dog it's the first time i heard it bark <laughs> so in terms of then removing the uh taxes on investment from overseas investors do you think this is going to you know, have a huge influx of tech companies to try to set up shop within. That's the idea, uh, as far as I can tell, right? Um, so that I think that that's the play. I think the play is for not just any, not just tech companies, but you know, uh, possibly what the Cayman and you know some of these uh, Caribbean uh, and even Panama, like. You know, to to set up your holdings companies there, right? Um, I, I'm kind of like uh, not super excited about what kind of uh, <laughs> you know unintended consequences that might bring to because sometimes you know when you look at things like the Panama Papers and <laughs> the, you know shady things that happens around like I finances totally like that. that. Uh, it, it, I don't want El Salvador to become that, but but I think that um, it is certainly trying to attract foreign direct investment, FDIs, right? Yeah. Uh, some capital into the country, right? Now, the last thing I want to touch on, and I think this might go a few minutes longer than I uh, than I think, so that's why I think we're going to go past an hour. My first Bitcoin. Yes. You're, you're involved with that. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk about that more than, than anything else, but that's Let's okay. Let's do it. I, we'll, we'll talk for the next couple hours. But I, want, I want to dive into <laughs> this because this is something that's really good. It's open source. And I'm giving the, the air quotes on this because it's yeah. available on – there's a GitHub you could go to there. Yes, And yes. you could get access to all the curriculum yeah. information. Yeah. This is a, um, a course that was initially – being offered in El Salvador yes. for individuals to learn more about Bitcoin. And it, some the curriculum was, I think some of the things were um, deleting, sorry, creating a wallet, deleting the keys and restoring it somewhere else. Yes. So that's one of yeah. the things. How many people out there that own Bitcoin right now have done that? No, like how many like... people have? <laughs> because that's one of the things Lots you of people should would do. fail. 
lots but, of people. Yeah, go ahead. Play. Let's talk about my first Bitcoin. I want to want to talk yeah. a little bit more. So the floor is yours, buddy. Go ahead. No, for sure. And I, I'll op- I'll openly admit that like I think some days I'm way over my head with this, right? Because it's such a popular um, program, and here's me <laughs> larping my way through it. Uh, but um, I'm at the point where in, in, in what you said at the beginning, it's open source, which means they, people don't need my permission to use it. Go to the GitHub. And what's cool about the GitHub is that the new curriculum in English and in Spanish has been updated. Uh, um, so fresh, brand new translations, things are simplified, graphics are better. The writing is a lot better. Everything's so much better. So like, you know, this version's even better. And it's so easy. Like if people just want to like learn about Bitcoin and go through that document, it's so complete. It's so good. And for me, it's it like what I get excited about is that like a, a um, there's an essential piece about understanding money in very simplified terms. It's aimed at youth. But I feel like It is also because so many of us older folks don't understand money because it's aimed at youth and using simplified examples and language that it, it actually really makes it easy for all of us to learn. And I think in, in order to understand Bitcoin, you really need to understand money. And um, that's kind of where, where I feel like one of the most essential pieces and one of the most valuable things about the program lies in, in taking you through that journey, right? And so I, was a, I have been able to, in my city, graduate a number of students who have been like, just amazed at like how much they did not know about our current financial system and like uh and and some of them shit coiners who are like oh yeah i i'm going to dump everything and just go all in on um on bitcoin and so um but i'm i'm wanting to spread this through canada and i think that there is the perception that like i need to do it and there isn't you I, you don't need my permission you just got to go to the github educate your family and friends first and then start out in the community and then just let me know how many people you've graduated how many people can restore their keys and make a, a functional wallet and uh, transact and i actually have been teaching this through high fees by the way so i'm i'm also including another layer of test net there because I want people to have the full Bitcoin experience. And so lightning's not a problem, but um, but um, uh, when we do transactions, we use test net so that people yes. get full experience without, yes. you know, paying an arm and a leg for, for the transactions, right? The other thing that I do teach is like the context under which we have to do this in Canada and in other, you know, more structured countries around taxes and finances is very different than in El Salvador, where it's actually money they can transact. So one of the things that I like uh, stress early on to everybody is that we're, we're going to do this in concept at first. And then when it's applied and we're using real Bitcoin, you are responsible for all of this and and you have to know where all of your Bitcoin goes. And so that's why we're going to do test net. So all of the stuff on chain that we do, you don't have to think about the taxes or anything, but everything that you do after, after that on your own, you have to, because like, you know, uh, like I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just teaching the 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 technical piece, but you, you still should know that you're responsible for your Bitcoin, where it goes, and you should keep good good records yeah. of that, right? And even we do a, a little piece with uh, with Lightning, and I always say keep good records where you got it, where it went, because there they may be just 10 satoshis right now who knows what that's going to be worth someday and and if the government needs to know or what you know they whatever then you at least have that record right especially for a class i mean like you know we talk about good privacy hygiene as well and 
as part of the course. And so then, you know, people can take that what they will and, and do best practices for themselves. Right. But, you know, uh, um, as far as me as an instructor, I'm, I'm concerned, I'm just giving people the tools so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. But, you know, as far as I go, I just make sure that everybody is well aware of, uh, of their responsibility when it comes to taxes. So that's the main difference between teaching the course here in Canada versus in, in El Salvador and other mm -hmm. places where you don't have to worry about capital gains and all that jazz. Look how lucky they are that they don't <laughs> yeah, leave yeah. the horse to water in terms of providing them the information. Yeah. It's up to them to drink and make sure that, that they process it correctly. In terms of the course, how often do you personally give that course? How often are you are you administering it? So we've uh, I've given one right now and um, <clears throat> uh, this year, uh, last year I gave two and um, and we're um, we got another cohort that's uh, probably in, over the summer and it's a 10 week course. And um, and so it's it's awesome. It's uh, I got little props for it uh i got like monopoly money i got even <laughs> cacao cacao beans because we use that as commodity money and it's real cacao and so uh the aztecs and the mayans used to use cacao as a, a form of currency and so i've kind of become like a, a bit of a uh well not an expert like in terms of archaeological or anthropological but, but at least bitcoin, in terms of was... bitcoin uh because i i dove the uh, cacao rabbit hole and cacao by the way if, uh it's really expensive right now it just like shot up um because of you <laughs> yeah clearly <laughs> i bought i bought a bag <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, so it's it's really fun, and we actually have a teacher here that has been approved to uh, to teach it in the school system in their financial literacy class, and I think it's a first in Canada. So we're super excited about that. We also had like it's you know we have it in consideration for a college program here in Canada, but I'm not sure how how successful that'll be, but there's interest in it. So, so we'll see. And, um, right now where I'm at with this is I need help. If you, you don't have to be an expert, you just have to have the will. And, uh, um, I have a, I'm, I'm compiling a telegram group, uh, and in the next week or so, I'm going to be, uh, um, uh, texting everybody in that telegram group about, um, you know, how, how to teach, give them the resources and maybe do, um, uh, a bit of a, a zoom or a Google meet so that, um, that we get going. Uh, like I said, people don't need my permission, but I still like to know how many people you've taught and graduated because my goal, at least for the year is to graduate, um, as many people as we can, not sure if how achievable is, but other would like to be other than El Salvador, the, the next biggest country of graduating, uh, people from this program. And so, you know, and, and you don't have to charge anything. It's free of charge. Like I, I saw on, uh, on Twitter that like, I don't know if this was serious or not, but this like one of these finance bro telling all these like dudes, it's like, you got to buy like Bitcoin right now. You didn't pay just 10, five grand for like this course, you know, just to blah, blah, blah. You got to buy Bitcoin. And I'm like, what? People paid five grand for a guy to yell at you to buy Bitcoin. Come on, man. Like just download it from <laughs> Mi Primera Bitcoin for free. I think but, I saw that video, by the way, that oh, you're talking about. Yeah. I guess I, some people need to be yelled at, I guess. I don't know. So we have in the chat, Boom Dust is saying, I want in on a Telegram group. Yeah. One of the guys up at the Ottawa meetup is a high school teacher and he wants to start a Bitcoin club at his school. So yeah, you guys get, get in touch. Um, okay, so DM me like uh, at Jamie or Jaime W Garcia. That's my that's my uh, um, Twitter or X handle. Just DM me. My DMs are open. Send me your Telegram uh, handle, and then I'll add you to that, and uh, and I'll send some information in about a week's time. In terms of the age of people. You were saying that it's generally for younger people. What would you say would be the the the, the youngest one should consider 
getting into this. And I guess there's an upper age, it could be, you know, until your death, right? So the people, adults could be even attending this, I'm assuming, right? Um, so my, I would say like my daughter's in grade eight, she would be like the prime candidate, I would say to start to talk about this. And the course would address a lot of it. The, the course itself is aimed for high schoolers. So like maybe grade 10 to 12, right? Um, but I've had people in their 20s, 30s, 40s and beyond taking the course. So, And here we have somebody else in the chat saying, Sax Strong 3000, 100% reaching out to hear Jaime. Thanks for launching in Canada. So it looks like you're going to get a second person from the chat that's going to be reaching out to you, just giving you a heads up on that. Yeah. Now, in, in terms of people that are wanting to take the course that you offer, is it in person, virtual? And if it's in person, where yeah. geographically is it? So so I, I've been offering the course here in Saskatchewan, um, and it's been in person. Um, and I, I preferred it that way because, um, like, I really want to meet the people, I think. Um, and just wanted to make sure that I was doing my pedagogy correctly. Uh, and actually, um, my wife's a teacher by trade. She doesn't practice it, but she, she told me it's, it's actually not pedagogy, but andragogy or something like that, because it's, uh, I'm teaching it to adults mostly. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what that word means. <laughs> it, it it just basically means like the art of teaching or the or the or the method by which you teach and people gain that knowledge, right? So so then the point is that like I'm teaching it mostly to adults and uh and I I I I want to make sure that the methods that I'm using are are striking and they're learning and so that's why I prefer to teach it in person. And the course itself, they 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 really propose strongly that you do it in meat space, which is just a fancy word for in real, in real life or yeah. in the world. Right. Uh, because then you can have more interactive stuff going on, but it has been taught um, online and I will do an online course in the fall winter as well. Um, but when it comes to like, if you want to be, prepared to teach i'm happy to jump on a google meet or on a zoom call and one of the exciting things that we got going on this year is that we, we got a couple people from el salvador coming to the canadian bitcoin conference in montreal and uh and i'm gonna be there and we're gonna do a bit of a presentation and actually bull bitcoin has uh, reached out to me about maybe doing um a bit of a workshop for educators and stuff like that. And, and um, you know, uh, we're also working with the Bitcoin, the, the Canadian Bitcoin coalition about, you know, what, how we can uh, work together in terms of our education efforts. And uh, all in all, I'm like, this is the, the one thing that I feel most excited about, most bullish about. And uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's good because um it, it, listen, it all starts with education. It, it all, and this is non biased education. We're not shilling, we're not shilling a product, we're not shilling mm -hmm. an exchange, we're not shilling anything. Like it's completely independent, unbiased. We're not even shilling El Salvador or nothing like that. Like uh, it was, came out of El Salvador and it's for the world and it's free. Um, I, I have charged nominal for the cost of running printing the the book if people want it but you don't have to that's the beauty of it if you want to charge zero or you want to charge for the cost up you know, you can as a teacher just to recoup some you know the printing and some of the props that you buy that you're probably going to reuse right you you can but it it's it's like it's zero right and and what i've done with my students i've actually printed out a sheet and say yeah i've charged you this much for all of this today, right? And and that's that's and I'm not and I'm not making any money. <laughs> it it then, does cost you to you right to print and even to rent the space too. I mean, the space isn't free. I'm assuming not. So luckily, I, I've been uh, uh, the guys uh, bit, uh, at uh, a quick bit uh, boutique here in uh, in 
and Regina have uh, provided the space for us. So, mm -hmm. so they, they've donated that, but, um, but yeah, like, you know, you have to think about those things, right? If somebody's able to donate their time and their space, then, then for sure, you know, you can pass, you know, that no cost to your students, right? If, um, but if not, then, you know, the reality too, is that like, Things sometimes when they're for free, people don't value them, right? <laughs> so, and it's important for people as part of the course to understand that there, there's always a cost and a trade-off, right? So it's like, oh, you guys don't want to be charged anything? There, there's no book. The book's going to be virtual. Right? You right. can print it on your own, right? So you're just providing information and education. And yeah. with that, hopefully they'll be able to parlay this into something bigger and better. How did you were able to get this shoehorned into the curriculum in the school system over there? Because you, you were mentioning that somebody over. Is... So, so Tyler, who's the teacher doing this, he has been a Bitcoiner for a little bit. And so like he is, he's, he's kind of where we're at. Right. Uh, so, and he's, he was like, what, what, what kids need to know this. And so and uh, I think that his superintendent was super like open to this idea. And he's like, wow, yeah, this makes sense to me. Go for it. So. Wow. That's incredible because generally, you know, it's so restrictive and it's rigid in its approach to have somebody within the, the, the walled gardens that have an open mind. This is unheard of in a lot of cases well, so this I'm is good screwing it up for them now <laughs> and there's no phone call from this conversation but, but i mean the thing is is like it's like you know like, like let's embrace this especially as canadians right like i mean <clears throat> look i mean i'm from el salvador and the goal is to move back there someday but you know the reason why people left el salvador to to los angeles and texas and everywhere else in the us and canada and sweden and australia is not because they wanted to leave their family behind but because they needed to there was war there was a necessity to leave right now my roots are here you know my wife's canadian my my you know my daughters they have their friends and family here we can't all leave el salvador to el salvador we have to, some of us have to stay here and although uh, at some point i will <laughs> go to el salvador um and and stay there uh um you know a lot of us can't and or can't for right now and so we have to make it better here and i think this is part of it and so some of the best uh, bitcoiners around the world are canadians mm -hmm. and um and so you know it um rather than like um you know push this aside we have to embrace it and say like look you know we can't be afraid of this this is just the the, the progression of the internet you know and um and so and we have some of the best minds in the world doing this that are from here and so why not you know make it better right so you know in terms of how it's being accepted in canada we, in terms of a nation, Canada's pushing or pulling our weight quite well in the Bitcoin world. We have a, a fair number of Bitcoiners, prominent Bitcoiners here in comparison to other nations, and we have a relatively small population. And also on top of that, say what you want about the country itself. The economy may not be doing as well as the United States, but in terms of how the laws and regulations pertain to Bitcoin, they're quite favorable in c comparison to other jurisdictions. Yes. Here, you could buy Bitcoin. The government's not going to give you mm -hmm. any issue. You can even buy KYC and no problems there. In fact, you're using Canada Post in, in regard to their Yobel Bitcoin shirt. You could. So with respect to that, Canada is a great place to be a Bitcoiner. So I, I just wanted to just, you know, there may be a lot of people out there that are down on the country for this or that reason. But if you take a step back and look what's going on, as a Bitcoiner, it's not too bad. It could be we could be in a lot worse places than than in Canada. So embrace it and take advantage while you can. Um, now, in terms of anybody that wants to do what you're doing, but do it on a different part of the country, say in, in BC, or what's the best approach? What type of skill set do they need? What sort of material or what do they need in order to start this? And um, yeah. yeah, so. Uh, Essentially, like I think that there's a lot of capable people. I think you need to be confident. So you need you need to be confident in your skills. You're probably the Bitcoin guy for a lot of your friends and family. Uh, so if you're that type of person, and um, e even if you're not, but you think you're close, 
um, you know, you, you probably that, that person. And, um, the way that I would say is like, um, uh, send me a DM, go to my first Bitcoins, get GitHub, download the PDF of the newest, um, uh, edition of the course, take a look through it and start by teaching your friends and family, grab your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, a couple buddies, and, uh, and just, um, you know, have them go through the course. So that's in a judgment free environment. And that's all really you'll need after that point. I think you, you're going to be for, for, if you're that person, you'll probably be in a position where you can, uh, do this for, for a lot of people. But, uh, but I would like to, to know who you are because you don't need my permission to do this. You can just go ahead and do it without even telling me. But I would like to know how many people are you graduating in your neck of the woods, and um, and then uh, so that I, we keep good um, records of how the the course is being used, <clears throat> and um, and I would like to get the um, this to a point where um, we reward educators across the country. Uh, we're not at that point yet, but we reward educators across the country and people who are graduating and creating a, a good community of, um, of, of graduates in, in your communities um, are rewarded for, for your um, efforts, right? So, yeah. And you know, Canada is a multicultural country. And I'm looking at the GitHub right now. I see four different translations. There could be more out there. Could have sworn it was Italian, but I see the English, the Spanish, Korean, and German version. So if you wanted to offer any of those different languages, you can yep. do so even in Canada. I mean, we have a lot of Koreans here, we have a small amount of Germans and Spanish speaking. There's peoples. there's a French version coming out right away too. Mm -hmm. So for our you know folks over in Quebec and other Francophone communities, actually there's a big Francophone and Metis and um um, mid community here in Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So, you know, there, yeah, like, and, and, and all the different languages, I think there's a Punjab coming. So oh. for Vancouver and Toronto and stuff like that. So, and other communities where there's a, a large Indian diaspora. So like, you know, there's, there's a lot of information that, um, or a lot of translations that, that not only are useful across the world, but in, in, in communities here within Canada. Were you involved at all with the translation of, of Spanish to English? I uh, know I, uh, I made a small little correction. That's about it. Okay. That, that was all done by Salvadorians and, and people on the ground, like John Dennehy and such. Very cool. Now, I guess we're getting kind of long in, in this one. Is there anything else you want to talk about uh, my first Bitcoin? Because I don't want to, to end this before we exhaust this topic and you make sure no. you, you, okay. The, <laughs> like I, I, I yeah, did, did I get passionate about this one because mm -hmm, I've I had tell. a lot of fun. I have had a lot of fun doing it. Um, probably too much time <laughs> doing it. And, and, and that's why I need help because like, I think like, you know, I'm, 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 get, I'm still raising my, family and I got other obligations and I, I want other people to carry the torch. Like it, this does not have to depend on me. This is open source. And I want other Canadians to sort of like take the initiative and, and do this with me um, and help me out in, in their communities. Right. Cause in the, the thing is that like, I can't be in Toronto and Vancouver or in Montreal where our biggest centers are, where there's more people to impact. So so that's, you know, I need help in those communities as well. And, um, and so, yeah, like, let's um, just send me a DM. I'll, I'll get you in the Telegram group and I'll send you some info shortly. If ever you are looking to have it broadcasted as well, let us know and reach out to Joy or I. Absolutely. Twitter and we'll happen. So, yeah. I mean, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Any last parting words that you want to uh, impose on us before we, uh, we go? Uh, because floor is yours, especially if people want to reach out to you after hearing about this. I mean, where could people reach you? Anything you want to talk about? You know, the yeah. last few minutes here is yours. No, I mean, you know, just um, enjoy life. Um, you know, um, we we tend to forget that there's, especially now where spring has sprung in a lot of parts of the country. You know, let's get off uh, the internet. Uh, I've 
I've actually unplugged a little bit while I've been sick and and I've uh, I, I feel like that's sometimes better for my um, emotional well-being uh, just uh, away from the uh, from from the Bitcoin chatter and gossip and and so just enjoy life enjoy family um, and um, yeah do your 100 push-ups a day <laughs> that see that's the other reason why I got sick I wasn't doing my push-ups <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, 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 I gotta take the first part of it to heart because this is going to be for me the summer of Len I'm, I'm, that's a, a, a reference to Seinfeld awesome. I'm going to be enjoying this summer as much as I can the last few summers I've been um, I've been very very busy but this one I, I'm going to start enjoying as you know Price will be high. It, it's going to be a good summer for me. But anyways, I mean, thanks for coming on. If anybody wants to reach him, in the notes below on the video and audio, it's our, it's his um, t Twitter or slash X. You can just reach out to him from there. And uh, yeah, buddy, thanks for coming on. And until next right. time, we'll have you. Whenever you have anything else, let us know, Jaime. We'll bring you back on, buddy. So let us thanks, know. Len. See ya. Thanks, love, buddy.